Well, let's get started. I just want to introduce everybody who's new here to Artful Minds. And Artful Minds is an online community. Our focus is on the artist's artistic development and growth. It's a place to have your meaningful discussions and to get direct feedback. Along with that, we have our weekly development exercises, weekly open office studio hours, so you can ask me anything directly. Monthly challenges, or we have our monthly critiques as well, and we're going to be having some upcoming master classes. And to find out more about us, you can go to artfulminds.ca, or if you'd like to see some of the community, you can go to community.artfulminds.ca and click into open studio where we have all our previous interviews. And with that, our inspirational discussion today is with Mitchell Albala. He's a landscape painter, instructor, and author out of the Pacific Northwest region. Uh, his luminous and semi-abstract landscapes are built using soft edges and simplified shapes. He's also the author, as most of you know, of two best-selling books. The first one was Landscape Painting, Essential Concepts and Techniques for Plain Air and Studio Practice. And the second one, who just came out in January, is the Landscape Painter's Workbook, Essential Studies in Shape, Composition, and Color. Mitchell has led the plein air workshops in Italy and teaches work shops throughout the Pacific Northwest and online. Uh, he has lectured on Impressionism and landscape painting in the Seattle Art Museum and has written for International Artists and Artists and Illustrators magazine. He also hosts a popular painting blog that has been rated top 100 painting blogs for artists. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a CV, I'd have to say. So thank you, Mitchell. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you doing this interview. Welcome. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody. I know you've created a little presentation showing your work, a mm -hmm. uh, little bit of slideshow. So just let me spotlight you and you can take us through that. This is just a little introduction to my work uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, there's definitely interests that I have and, and there's a common, a common thread that you'll see in my work. I've always be, been interested in uh, the inherent abstraction within nature. Like there's a strong abstract component, not entirely abstract, but a, a, an abstract component within a lot of my work. And then there's also this very atmospheric kind of light thing going on, which often becomes very luminous, not always, but sometimes. So this is, this is a piece called Cascadia from a waterfall series I did some years ago. There's a, a series I also did on mountainscapes. It's called like Sunlight and, and Snow, which coincidentally is is on exhibit now at a gallery here locally in, in Seattle. But this is a piece uh, from that series and it shows my interest in pattern and design and color. But primarily it's a very, actually we'll be talking about Notan a little bit later. This one has a very strong positive, negative, dark light Notan design. But it, it's all about from pattern, atmosphere, color, abstraction. Those are the kind of things that I'm, I'm most interested in. And I, and I hope as I go through this, you'll see a thread. You'll see a thread here among these paintings. Um, now here's one of them from that same series, Mountain of uh, uh, Sunlight and Snow. And this is one where I'm really trying to push the edge of the envelope, as it were, as in the envelope of light, to really kind of get the colors to glow, to, to really impart a sense of brilliant, brilliant light in the painting. You know, because color painting is never as luminous as, as true, true sunlight. So as painters, we have to kind of come up with all kinds of clever tricks and techniques to like, how do we get this painting? It's never going to glow like sunlight, but geez, can I do something that at least when the viewer looks at it, they might have a similar impression as if they were looking at the real thing. Here's another one. Uh, this one is an experiment. I did a number of paintings, which actually the, the glowingness of this one is coming from a gold ground. It's gessoed with gold and then every other color that you see the green around the periphery and the dark blacks at the bottom are all with color laid over that gold so gold is serving as the light constant if you will though the part that serves as as sunlight and brilliance again very simple compositions here's and then i go into something that's a little more complicated this is uh i think it's kind of abstract it's like if you squint at it like my my thought is that your first impression would be pattern pattern and design. And then secondarily, you start to absorb the details. And there's quite a lot of detail in this one, but I'm a big believer that when you play with detail, the detail must always remain subordinate to the big driving shapes. And that's what I was aiming to do in this one. And then in recent years, I've been working on urban landscapes. I'm taking the same sensibility, abstraction, luminosity, pattern, and seeing how it's applied to the urban landscape. And what's really interesting is a lot of these urban landscapes in actuality 
were incredibly complex, but I had to distill it down to the point where I'm just showing you enough information that you'll know it's an urban landscape, but not so much that it becomes just this giant detail fest, which is really not what the paintings are about. Here's another one. This is actually the view right outside my window. I've done, I did a whole series of paintings and different lights and different compositions, but they all they all play with that, that roof line and to get a little perspective in there. Here's another one from that series of urban landscapes. This one looks like a plein air painting, but it was actually done in a studio based on a photograph. But it also speaks to actually all my paintings here. None of these paintings, except the last couple that are plein air examples, None of these paintings were color that I, you know, copied from photographs or based it on color studies that I did outdoors. All my color is kind of designed from the ground up. I mean, I may loosely have a reference photo or uh, something in memory, but it's a color strategy really is what it is. It's a plan, it's colors. I, I use the word architected kind of to, to, to express the design of the colors, but the colors are my own is, is another way of saying it. I'm not slavishly following what I see when I look out the window, nor am I slavishly following the photograph. I, I have to be kind of the keeper and designer of my own color scheme. And then here's the last two. This is just wanted to show you what some of my plein air paintings look like because they're really kind of a different animal. They're much more traditional, kind of straight up landscapes, very simple. And then the things that I do in the studio, which were all the previous paintings, you had just seen. Those are more planned. They're more designed. I, I do more color studies. I play around with the composition more before I start the final painting. So they really, for me, the plein air experience forever informs my studio experience, but they really are kind of two different animals. And you can see that reflected in the work itself. These, these are nice little paintings, but they're very different than what I do in the in the studio. Are there any questions about that before I um, close out this portion, Michael? Oh, I thought the, it was interesting, your yellow uh, mountain of light. I know it's a mountain and I know it's all yellow, but what's interesting to me is it's very much like the surface of the sun. And this is what I love about paintings is you can interpret it to really suit your feeling towards it. So I thought that was quite interesting how, how it is something, but to me, it's something else. Yeah, well, everyone's going to have a little bit of a different experience uh, of it. Let's just jump right into this here. Yeah. And we're going to talk about Notans. And I want to talk about Notans because I feel they're more important than I ever thought they might be. About 10 years ago, I took a workshop and they were explained to me as a four value study. And so I did the exercises in the workshop and I got the gist of it and I tried to do them over the years, but I was, yeah, I always found them uninteresting and boring and too much work. And then about a year ago, I've been painting with some friends and I see she starts just using a Sharpie. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I started looking into it a little bit more. And also with these interviews with Skip Whipcomb and Maria Josenhans, it's been revealed to me and even reading in your book, no tans are not a value study at all. And in your book, your new book on page 90, you actually state, when we understand no tan as being less about identifying values and more about shape and overall pattern, it becomes an extremely versatile compositional aid. So can you provide some examples and just explain this yeah, a little bit better? Yeah, I have a few, a few pictures. Uh, you know, I've been teaching no tan for many years now. I used to teach no tan workshops. Now, whatever I do with no tan has gotten rolled into my bigger real world composition workshop. But no tan is tricky in the work that I've done with it. I, I'm kind of tipping the focus a little bit differently. Most people, I believe, regard it as a value study. And uh, for me, it's what makes this is what makes no tan tricky is that we're using values. We're using black and white or black, white, and a mid gray to render our little study. Are those values? Yes, of course. So does that make it a value study? Well, maybe not because a value study has a different intent. Here, let me share the screen for a moment and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let me just first say that to me, a no tan, and I think most other people would agree with me, is simply a type of compositional study. Now, that study can be beautiful in its own right, and you know, it's a, it could be a finished work of art, but generally speaking, the way I teach it, the way I use it, it is meant to be a compositional study. And so you see some over here in, in black and white, and some are, and the one in the middle is, a, is black, white, and a middle gray. So this is why I do a no-tan study. Like, so there's the subject, 
kind of big and sprawling. And each one of these are done with a Sharpie, the way Michael was talking about. And the reason I do them is which one of these makes the best composition? Or like, what am I after in this subject? So I just can pull these off really quickly out in the field. My workshops, we actually just kind of trace right off the photograph. But I think all of them have their charms and, and their benefits. You'll notice that some are horizontal and some are vertical, which is another thing that you think about as you're defining composition. So the Note 10 is really a compositional study, but here's where it gets a little sticky. So uh, here's a painting, right? Now this painter is pretty tight, pretty realistic, strong patterns of light and shadow. So there's this painter's Notan study. It's actually a digital conversion, but same difference. This is the, the Notan of that painting. And in this case, yes, the Notan has almost a direct one-to-one -one correspondence to the painting. Why? Because this particular painting has very clear and decisive patterns of light and shadow. The problem is that not all, and maybe not even most paintings, present their light this way. So let's take a look at this one, right? Here's a great painter, Mark Bonney. In this painting, I'm reverse engineering what he did, like I'm doing the Notan study after the fact, you know, just to make the point. But so like, if I do this, that's a pretty, pretty good rendering or a pretty good indication of this pattern of trees and foliage that run through the picture in this diagonal fashion. That's a pretty good indication of it. But in this painting, this beautiful blue path and blue gray path and shadow, that's a pretty important part of the composition. So if I had tried to assign black to that, right, that would just look terrible. Like clearly that's not a very good composition. But if I go to three values, oh, then suddenly this is as effective as the first one I did, but it's paying some respect to that mid-tone, right? So notice that the value of this big black mass here is not an exact match to the value over here, nor is this gray value over here. This is just a 50% perfect gray value. It's not a perfect match to this path and shadow, nor is the white up here a perfect match to the value here. So this is what I mean when, you know, when we're playing with two values or we're playing with three values, someone said, you said a moment ago about uh, you, when you first did it, Michael, it was a four value. Yep. Once you get into four values, to me, in my, my subjective opinion is you're, you, you've left no tan land and you're now into, into value study land because with four values, you've really got enough values to do a lot of indicating of the basic value areas of the subject. But we don't see the world like this. And so this is a very synthetic interpretation. This is really the, the power of the Notan. The Notan is a kind of a visual map or a study of the patterns and the shapes that make up the composition. Yes, sometimes those patterns and shapes have something to do with the values that we actually find in the subject, but most of the times they only have a little bit to do with the values and they're more about just defining the shapes. That's why I say it's not so much a value study as it is a study for defining shapes and patterns. So what I've done is talk about two value, no tan, which I call strict, right? And many subjects will translate nicely with Two value. I think two value is the most potent and the most direct, but it's also the most difficult. Why? Because we don't see the world in this way. This study on the right here doesn't have any grays, but there's a ton of gray values in the original. What do we do with those grays? Well, we have to either push them over to the black or push them over to the white. That's a very tricky exercise. So that's why we introduced the liberal or three value notan. And that one adds that third value. Again, that third value is not about matching values in the subject. It's just about giving us a little bit more shape range. So like in this, in this subject, these distant blue hills were really important to the subject that might've actually even been why one would paint it. And so if I made them white, well, I'd lose them all together. If I made them black, ugh, it would look horrible. But by making them gray, I'm really indicating them kind of as a separate shape. So I, I work with strict notan and liberal notan. It takes a little bit of practice and, and you get the hang of it as you go ahead with it. Also, there's, um, I think in the interview notes at the end, there'll be a link. I gave a presentation on, on Notan for like an hour and a half once, and it's still available. You can go check that out if you want. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, when you get that link, I'll add it to the uh, replay video for sure. Yeah. Now, what I find interesting in those uh, Notan value studies on the first and second page, I believe, is mm -hmm. you had a variety of proportions on your canvas, and that is an important compositional tool 
deciding on the right proportion. Yes. And I did notice that a lot of them were off the shelf sizes, like a nine by 12, like my 14 square, double wide. Mm -hmm. Do you ever go off book and decide on a composition that's a little different than standard sizes that are available? Oh, I do it all the time because the way I learned composition was I would find the subject then I would just kept playing with the perimeter and f trying to find the, the sweet spot. And uh, sometimes that wasn't a standard format and sometimes it was, but learning to compose that way has led me to a place now in my practice and also in what I teach where format, that is the square, the horizontal or landscape format or the extended vertical format is very, very important to the composition. It's actually the first decision that we make about composition, like yeah. how is our subject going to fit into that picture window? And is that picture window going to be wide, tall, or, or square? So it's a very important decision. In short, I have stuff in my book about this, but in short, the horizontal format tends to, well, here's the thing you got to know about a format. The format itself asserts a directional energy and we usually think oh i'm designing this picture and there's mountains flowing this way so yeah i've got some horizontal energy from the mountains but that in fact the format if it's horizontal the format itself is asserting some horizontal energy so we have to be mindful of that and the vertical format tends to kind of compress things this way which kind of makes things feel like they go inward and upward, which is a very encouraging thing when you want to suggest space. And then there's the square format, which as you might guess, does neither. It doesn't have any directional energy this way, and it doesn't have any inward and upward directional energy this way. So it's almost a little bit static or it points a little bit toward the center. And that's why it's often used um, to kind of foster abstraction. So when I use a square format, I have to be sure about what's going on my compositional elements because I'm not getting any help from the format. It's just kind of null or neutral and my shapes and patterns that I put into the subject or the painting are what's going to drive the movement in the composition. Did all yeah. that make sense, Michael? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you said something there about fostering abstraction. So along with the Notan, in the Notan, especially in your black and white, are you looking for more of the abstract shapes for an interesting composition? Yeah, I, I absolutely am. And for me, I'm often interested in promoting the abstract, but not everybody is, and that's by no means a requirement. I mean, on one hand, a composition especially a simplified notan in one level is kind of abstract because it's just flat shapes and patterns, which is abstract. But that doesn't mean that one is adopting a notan practice or doing compositional studies that necessarily going to make an abstract painter out of you. No, that's not the goal. No, no, not at all. The thing that the Notan does that's so beautiful is that it breaks down, or rather it reduces the compositional elements to their bare bones. Like it doesn't get any simpler than what you can express in a Notan. And that has a way of getting at the compositional essence, which is always what we want to do at the outset when we're determining our composition. You never get to a good composition by hyper-focusing on the detail up front. You have to focus on the big mass shapes. Detail is attached to those shapes a little a little bit later. Yeah. So so really, if you have an interesting Notan, if it's interesting to you, chances are it's going to make a more successful painting because it'll be more yeah, interesting. That's exactly yeah. the, the idea. Yeah. The, you know, the Notan is, like I say, bare bones. And then when we do the final painting, all the other stuff, the color, the brushwork, the detail gets gets hinged or attached to it. In all my workshops, I'm forever encouraging folks to do compositional studies. It's a, it's a little bit difficult for me to get a handle on a subject if I don't do some kind of compositional study. doesn't mean it has to take a long time. Sometimes it happens in a minute, but it's very important. Um, oh, yeah. Now, this kind of leads us to the next step into a painting. And, you, you know, you, you have your notan, you have your structure based. Now you get into painting. And something that's always been said to me in previous workshops and books is this paint what you see. And I think there's some validity to that, but I think people glom onto that a little bit too much. And I found it, again, in your new book there, page 104 of your book discusses direct observation versus in, informal modifications. And to me, there's a word of fire. Like, sometimes you're ready to hear information. Other times an author just is mm -hmm. able to put the right words in the right order to make more sense to you, right? Mm -hmm. And I think your wording clarifies this so much. So can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, I can talk about it. And I have two little pictures to go with that too. So let me just go grab them. What Michael was just saying was... Uh, direct observation, which is largely what we do when we're painting outside. And then I coined this term 
informed modification. You won't find that term elsewhere. I, I said, what is the perfect term to describe what we do when we're in the studio and we're starting to be more inventive and expressive with color? And I came up with the term informed modification. But let me just say, when it comes to in a direct observation, this is nothing new. Everybody listening today at some point, whether it was out in the landscape or painting a still life or a figure or whatever, you were looking at the subject and you were trying to record the values and the colors as best you can. That's direct observation. And it is a bedrock of the lessons we learn as representational painters. Another way of saying it is be hard to be a representational painter if you didn't pay respect to direct observation. And also I always call it how do you translate light into paint, right? They're not the same thing, right? Remember that yellow painting we were looking at? That was not what I saw, but it was something that conferred upon the viewer perhaps a similar experience to brilliant sunlight. So the direct observation teaches us an incredible amount about mixing color, translating color, and about the limitation of natural light versus the light within our paintings, right? But, this is a big but, all in capital letters and bold, when we paint in the studio, all direct observation, not all, but most direct observation is gone. It's like, what do I mean by that? So you might have a photograph that you took, which is a looks like a fairly accurate recording of what you uh, saw. You might have a color study that you did. You might have a plein air painting that you did, which contains important information about the subject. But the, even if you're referring to that photograph or that color study, the fact is you are no longer doing direct observation, are you? You're doing what I call informed modification to greater or lesser degree, you are now inventing color. You're, you're becoming the master of your color domain, as it were. And this is what all painters who paint in the studio are doing. I, I've been formulating this, I don't know if it's, it's a phrase or, an, or, or a quote of some sort. It became a little bit clearer to me as I was writing the book, and especially when I was uh, discussing this topic in the chapter. And what I wrote was, the longer I paint, the more I think that most of the time, most of the color that goes into my painting has less and less to do with the colors I actually see in the subject. Does that make sense? It means that when I began my journey years and years ago, I relied very much on direct observation. But not only do I suspect that this is the case for me these days, that most of what goes on with the color in my paintings is informed modification, meaning I'm changing things, I'm, I'm being more inventive with the color. I actually think it's what's going on with most good painting that we see. I don't think it's entirely possible to do this one-to-one one replication of the colors that you see in nature. What we are trying to do is try to produce a response in the viewer that is very like what they see, an emotional response that's like what they see in the real subject, but it's never going to be the real subject because real light glowing, illuminated by the sun is one thing and the light in our paintings is another. And it's interesting in both of my books, I talk about this in various ways. It's it's sort of like a basic premise you have to understand. This if there if anyone has this notion of like, oh well, I'm painting the colors exactly as I see, and I'm not a success until I can do that. No, that's not right. That's not right. It's just it's informed modification is where most of us end up, and it's something that's to be embraced, but it's also that informed modification is better informed and is smarter through my experiences with direct observation. So the two kind of play off each other. Oh, that reminds me of something I heard once before. Sometimes you have to just have to stop looking at your reference and paint for the sake of the painting. And what you're saying is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I yeah. often tell folks, and I do this too, if you pin up a color reference, I don't care who you are, you're going to follow it. So if you don't want to do that, at some point, you need to just put the darn reference away. In other words, you take what you need from your reference, your studies, your photos, whatever. But at some point, you need to stop listening to that and start giving your painting what it's asking for because it's a conversation yeah. the painting is telling you stuff and you need to listen now i want to talk a little bit into color theory color theory often gets emphasized by many people that we're just talking about 
hue interaction. And that's not right. necessarily the case, right? And I think, again, I'm going to refer to his book on page 114, just because it fits the question so well, is you fill in an essential piece of the puzzle by noting that a complete strategy also involves value, contrast, and relative saturation. And I think this is one of those things where finally someone has said something in appropriate words that it means a lot more than what we think it is. So it isn't all about you. It's about values, contrast, and relative saturation. So can you discuss this a little bit more in detail? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Let me do that. Yes. Yeah, so what Michael was just saying, which he told from my book was that when people like I, I could if I polled you know 20 artists and said oh what's your color strategy right they would say something like oh well I use complementary or it was analogous or split complementary and I get it that's pretty much the way the language goes and that's mostly what people think about what a color strategy is but in my book I, I set out to kind of redefine how we think about a color strategy it's much more holistic than that so these things I purposely put up a color wheel and I'm showing you the little color interactions there that you're all so familiar with. I put that up because I it's a very important point. That is just one third of what a real color strategy is. In actuality, it's uh, color, think of it as a three-legged stool. The, the complete color strategy is a three-legged stool. So yes, one leg, and it's you need that leg, it's very vital, is these things that I call hue interactions, right? Sometimes people call them color interactions or whatever, but they're hue interactions. They're essentially, how do these colors bounce off each other? Uh, how do they relate? Are they closely related? Are they far apart? Do they contrast with one another? Very, very important what you're seeing up here at the top of the screen. But the other two legs are values and saturation levels. Now, you're listening to this and you're going, oh yeah, hue, value and saturation that's those are the three things that you learned how to create a specific color right every single color is a particular you it has particular lightness or darkness and it has a particular saturation level absolutely but what what i do in the book is i try to show you how those three components or those three legs of the stool also apply globally to the painting itself. So I, here's an example of that, right? This is a painting by Roger Bechtold. Um, his work is in my, and actually in both my books. This is the actual painting, right? Now notice, look, I'm gonna tease apart each one of these three parts of the color strategy. Here, I've converted it to black and white. Now notice that it doesn't go all the way from black. It doesn't go all the way from white to black. It's like a, a light gray and a, and a dark gray. So the, the value range is a bit compressed. Isn't that interesting? You might not notice that just looking at the color version because the color is doing so much, but the values are rather compressed. Now, what if I were to take this painting and punch up the value contrast, right? That's what it would look like. Now. That looks pretty good, but it's a different experience than the painting in the upper left. Now, what if I were to take this same painting, not adjust the values, but exaggerate the color saturation? I would get this, right? So there are differences, like each, like lo looking at these three, they're all good, but they are working differently. They are going about the business of suggesting light in different ways because those three things the U interaction, which here happens to be complementary. And notice that in the in the strong value contrast one, we kind of lose much of the complementary relationship because the violets, which we see so readily in the upper left and the lower right, we can't really see anymore. So this one is pretty much being driven by some really strong darks and a few punchy yellows. Whereas here, the values come out. We've got the U interaction, complementary relationship. We've got how the relative contrast, strong contrast or weak value contrast, and then we've got saturation levels. Every one of those things is at work in every single painting, depending on how we balance them. Well, that's, that's the whole creation of the, of the color strategy. Yeah, so for example, here's a painting of mine. It's got neutral colors down below. We're talking about saturation levels now and fairly saturated colors above in the sky. So I'm juxtaposing neutral colors versus saturated colors. The values are also a bit compressed. I didn't make the, the, the values in the lower section as dark as they could be. They're actually headed toward mid-level, right? So that value choice makes a big difference. And then the U interaction is, 
in this one complementary again just coincidentally it happens to be yellow and violet so all three legs of the stool are in operation now what you'll find is that you have to kind of dig down kind of deep into this in your own work to find this out but not all three legs of the stool are necessarily operating equally very often one of those legs it becomes like the driver like it's the main event like like if, if i if i heighten the like if i go back to the this painting and i heighten the saturation level well then the saturation level starts to become the driving part of the color strategies not that the values don't matter anymore or that the U interaction doesn't matter anymore, but it becomes really key. As a matter of fact, the, that, the in this lower one on the lower right, the upping the saturation actually heightens the U interaction, right? So it's it's like a it's like a three-way seesaw with these three legs of, of the stool. You sit on one end, it affects the other two. And if you if the other two change, it affects that one. It's kind of like they're all at play in each in each one. I hope that that was the mini version of that whole thing which is a rather large topic i give a whole a whole workshop in color strategies just just focusing on this whole business but it's very important i find it very helpful to be able to assess my paintings and others paintings in this context like don't just think about it as oh it's complimentary and now we're done no it's there's other things going on maybe the values are very compressed and maybe they're very strong that will absolutely affect your reading of the light and the color strategy. Yeah, and I think it's nice how you said that one will overpower the other. So in the very beginning one, it's more of the hue interaction. And as you get darker, then it's the more the value interaction is with the chromatic one, it's the more the saturation. They're not all balanced, it seems. They're, there's always one more dominant than the other. Yeah, another, another term I sometimes use is like throttles. I'm looking for a good visual of a throttle to put into the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there's three throttles and they're not all equally activated right one tends to rule what well, one can rule and influence the others in a very strong way yeah yeah for sure and it, going with the color strategy does take you away from representational colors that you see whether you're out painting from life or you're painting from a photo and so you start off almost in an informed what do you call it, an informed modification sec area where mm -hmm. you're curating mm -hmm. the colors curating, instead of right, where you're yeah. curating the color yeah you have yeah. to and, I and a question a, a question popped in yes the, chat there. She asks, do you start out your painting with a color strategy in mind or does it develop as the painting progresses? Oh no, I, I start out with a color strategy in mind. Yeah. For sure. Now that isn't to say that sometimes things don't go according to plan and I have to modify it in mid stage. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I would be, it'd be very unsettling for me to do a painting without any idea of what my color strategy is. I mean, at a minimum, I need to be thinking about like, let's say I'm outside plain air painting even, which is the situation where, yeah, I am going to be trying to match the colors more or less. Yep. You know, I will be trying to do that. I might think, well, oh, look, it's a little foggy out this morning. The values are not so strong. Well, those that compressed value range is what's going to give me my atmosphere. And it's like, oh, well, the colors are kind of neutral. Fog tends to do that. Or, you know, should I add a little bit of excited, saturated color in one spot so the whole thing doesn't look boring? I mean, I am thinking about all these things. It's like I joke in my uh, color strategies workshop when we're getting started. I say the whole purpose of the workshop is I just want you to think about it. <laughs> you know, it really boils down to that. The more awareness you can bring to that color strategy, the better off you're going to be, even if you're even if you're making changes and kind of freelancing your way across the color as you do the painting. What are some good ways to create gamuts, digital and with paint? Gamuts is a whole different um, well, gamut, topic in a in sense. Well, means range. Yeah, it's a little so bit what's different. What's a good way to create? I'm not sure this will answer your question, but what I say is that when you're starting a painting and you have your, your strategy in mind, it's a good idea to know what your lightest light is going to be, which isn't necessarily white, and what your darkest dark is going to be, which isn't necessarily black it's like you know you have, might have a you have a potential value range that goes like this but maybe in your painting it's only over here or only over here and it's good to know that range by the same token i think it's also good to know what the range of saturation is going to be saturation you know which is sometimes called chroma or intensity um can be really hot and screaming like fresh out of the tube super high saturation and we rarely use colors that high there there may be notched down a little bit but it's get it's good to know where you are on the 
those ranges, what I do in my workshops is I have these charts where I show like full saturation from, you know, really dull to really saturated and full value from really dark to really light. And it's helpful to kind of have a, an approximate idea of where you're going to land on that because it, it's, a, it's a plan. And, yeah. you know, through experience and observation, you start to know what things produce what effects. And that's why you think about it and you'll, it'll, it'll just like, it's questions. If you ask yourself a question about where am I going with the color, you're more likely to find an answer. And any answer you find is gonna be informative. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, from my experience, I think you'd be better off instead of playing with gamuts, it's just to worry more about, kind of, like you say, your color strategy with your value and your, uh, your chroma of your colors. I think that's a lot more useful strategy than trying to come up with a gamut plan. I don't know what your opinion is on that. I think, uh, well, at least as I'm understanding the question, gamut means ranges. And I do think about my value ranges and my saturation ranges, which is part of the of that three-legged color strategy that uh, the complete color strategy that I was talking about. Yeah. And this kind of leads us into, you know, you're talking about, especially when you're outside planning plain air, you get the fog rolling in, the color is less saturated and more saturated depending on where you are. And you get a yeah. really sense of what's going on. And without a doubt, painting from life helps you immensely. And for everyone who's ever thought about doing it, but keeps on putting it off, just stop putting it off and do it because it'll, it'll exponentially grow your, your visual observation. And and that leads me to this next question really is, um, can you go over the perils and pitfalls of photo references? Oh. Especially because people with photos, all of a sudden, even if they do their no tan and their composition, they're just painting a photo. Well. You know, I think what I can say about that, I don't have any visuals to support this, but I would think it's very fair to say, and I think if there were 10 instructors here, every one of them would agree with me, that following the photo too religiously or too closely is not a prescription for great color. So there are many reasons for that. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna just quickly share the screen with you. There's a great article and it's really, it's feature length. There's a lot of information here about exactly what you're talking about, the perils and pitfalls and what to look for with photographic reference. And look, I use photographic reference all the time. Every one of those studio paintings that I showed you earlier, I had a photo pinned up and I was following it for design, for drawing, but not really for color. Because again, I just feel that I have to, to produce the effects that I'm interested in, I have to bend color to my will. Which isn't to say that you won't use some of the color that's in the photo, of course. I'm not saying, you know, you've got a, a blue and purple sunset scene and then you change up the colors to be green and yellow or something. No, I mean, you're, you know, you're giving some allegiance to what you're uh, seeing in the photo, but you have to be willing to give the painting um, what it needs. So I know that being a little more creative with the color, taking charge of the color strat is harder. For sure, it's harder. Like I can see it in, in the workshops when I teach it. It's a stretch. Like it's, if I just had copy the photograph and then just helped everyone match the colors, it would be sort of like a color matching exercise, which would be helpful. But it is different when you're taking charge of the color on your own and you're being inventive with it. I mean, I really think that's where we ultimately want to go. We want to think like painters, I'll think like colorists. I guess, you know, getting back to that whole thing about observed color, direct observation and form modification. It's probably a blend of both things, but following a photograph straight out the window is a pretty uncreative way of, I mean, I mean, if it's a good photo, you might be nice. It might be a nice, a nice painting in the end, but I, I think uh, you owe it to yourself to kind of try to stretch a little bit beyond what you see. And again, the more you know about color and everything, the more you'll know where the photograph is giving you flaws that you have to you have to improve upon. So that's the short answer to a very big question. <laughs> oh yeah, without a doubt, yeah. So with that, really it's about putting in your miles, I guess. You just gotta paint and paint and everything will be revealed to you in layers. There's never ever one way to hit everything at once right. observed unfortunately but i at the very beginning of this you're showing some of your plein air pieces mm -hmm. and so I, I think you're more of a studio painter than you are a plein air painter yeah correct me if i'm wrong but you still do your plein air and i agree yeah. when i go out plein air painting i kind of just yeah that's kind of greeny that's more bluey i kind of do more representational of the colors sometimes i try to push myself or not but now you have that study from plein air and you want to do that large in your studio what wow. are your what are your steps at going from a plein air piece or even a small studio piece to a larger studio piece? Well, I'm not someone who generally takes what I do in plain air and just 
scales it up to a larger painting because my lighting effects, I guess, they're very fleeting. You know, they're foggy, they're atmospheric, they're glare. These are these are not things that last in plain air, and I don't mean last for two hours. I mean they don't last for five minutes. So I'm really bending my subjects to do something a little different, like be abstract or be ultra atmospheric or to glow or something. And that's what I'm most interested in. And I don't actually find that just kind of walking around painting my everyday landscapes. So I don't really generally translate a plain air painting into a large painting, but I, I will take photos of an interesting subject and then. Then when I get back to the studio, I'll do some color studies or I'll modify the photo in a very significant way on the computer, which starts to suggest to me a painted direction for, for the color and the, and the composition. That's my really short, incomplete answer. Okay, no, that, that's great. So you, so you use plain air painting as more of a, an enjoyment and a um, exercise it's, to yeah, it's, it's, it's the place increase your where knowledge. I, I flex my color mixing muscles, and as I said before, it's where I learn how to translate light into paint, which one can never do perfectly, but what a wonderful exercise it is. Yeah, when you get something that you're really happy and pleased with, it's such a great feeling without a doubt. It is. It's very yeah. satisfying. Yeah, and for those that don't happen or work out, it's a humbling experience and it just helps you grow really as an artist so failures yeah. are nothing more than just an education Being an artist is a humbling experience yeah, yeah to say the least um, right now we've talked a lot about design and compositional elements that we put into the painting or mm -hmm. could be putting in a painting and, and how they can be put into the painting but do you have any go-to compositions or designs or value keys or color preferences that you well, drive um, towards in painting there's a lot there's a lot okay um, but i think that i'll just mention one which when i work with this seems students on composition the one that they often miss like i said there's a lot to it and i and i cover m much of it in my in my book and that is as you're selecting it's really helpful there's this thing called variation now variation includes many things it's variation in size variation in value and uh, value density the intervals between elements should be different but generally when i'm starting a composition and i'm selecting because isn't that what you're doing you're your grant there's like these five big shapes or a tent you know whatever's out there and you're selecting them to fit like i'm framing my face i'm selecting a certain set of shapes to go into my composition when you're doing that one of the most important things is to get as big of a size differential between the main masses as possible like big and small you don't want all the shapes to be about the same size like you don't want a sky going across that's about the same mass as the mountain range that's about the same mass as the foreground you want as big of a size differential as possible i'll just share this one little screen share with you right so this is a, a pastel painting by an artist bill Cohn, and there's a lot of great things going on in this painting but one of the things that i think is it really helps make it great is if you squint at it the relative size of that light portion of the canyon wall versus the shadow portion big size differential and so right here's another one so one of the easiest places to find this size differential is in when you have that horizon line you have a sky above it and you have land or water below it what is the like to get as big of a difference as possible so like the, the photo on the left is a great photo but the information above the horizon line and below the horizon line is is kind of similar in mass. So just to kind of push the example in the middle example, the horizon lines push way up and it's a whole lot allocated to the water. And on the right one, it's the land and the water is pushed way down and a whole lot has been allocated to the sky. So that's a sort of an exaggerated example of a place where you would think about the size differential between the main masses. You have to make a mental note of this because I have found with composition that people just don't do this stuff automatically. I mean, they, they might crop it and frame it a little bit and look for stuff, but it's good to set up little, uh, as I call them, post-it notes to self when you're painting to think about size differential and the intervals and why we do that, by the way, I don't know if I said that, because differences make it interesting. Hey, Michael, before we wrap it up, can I just show a, a few slides from, from my new book? Probably most of you know, but for those who don't, I have a new book that just came out just this past January. This one is a little bit different than my first one. I mean, it's covering, it's still covering composition and color and shape interpretation. But what I've done with this one is that I called it a workbook because I, I, I give you exercises. Exercises are different than demonstrations. 
demonstrations or I show you how I did the painting. Now you go off and do your own painting. An exercise is more like, it's not meant to be a beautiful painting. It's just meant for you to practice a focused idea. And I find uh, it works really well in my workshops. So I many of these exercises in the book were ones that I did in my in my workshops over the years. So we also have uh, like, here's here's one of the exercises as an example and there's 10 of them i believe and another thing that each chapter has remember we talked about those questions the post-it notes the end of each chapter has a series of questions which are kind of like summaries of the things to ask yourself like like a checklist so like in this one we're talking about detail and i'm talking about the balance between you know the detail and the main masses and of course my argument always is that it's the main masses that rule and the details are less focused so i, I call it the 80 20 rule there's a lot in there and i hope you'll you'll check it out there's a link to it at my website and what else? Um, were there any other final questions that came in? Just about your book. One viewer already has ordered both and they just arrived, but which one should they start reading first? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, probably the first one, see the first one covers uh, some fundamentals that the second book doesn't. Like the first one covers underpainting, for example, which is super, super important. And it, like, we didn't really talk about that today, but it covers underpainting. I mean, it makes sense that, that you'd start with the with the first one, but I wouldn't hesitate to open up the second one and see how that applies to whatever you're you're doing. You can jump around in these, in these books. The new one is the one that really focuses on this whole business with the color strategies and this practice that I call color grouping, which is a whole chapter devoted to, which is very much allied to color strategies. It's something I, I do with in all my workshops and all my classes. It's very helpful. Good. That's a great direction. Do you have time for just one more question? Yeah. Okay. And this comes to about being an artist and how we always put ourselves out there and we're quite exposed really through our art. Um, yeah. How do you manage discouragement and judgment, uh, not just from others, but from yourself? Actually, it's it's a constant it's a constant challenge. I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because it's, it's a topic that I've, I've thought about writing on, you know, in my blog or discussing in my mentor groups because we don't really talk about it much. When you're an artist, you you really are putting yourself out there, certainly to others, and the others can judge your work or they can like it or not like it. And then, but mostly, you're putting it out there in front of yourself. And that's probably more of the acid test. Like, how do we deal with, well, my painting didn't come out good. Like I started a painting yesterday and I hadn't painted in a while because I was away and I was having a show this month. So I was kind of preoccupied and I started it and it was all right. But after spending, um, you know, three hours on it, I realized, oh, I'll probably restart it. You know, every painting that you do is not a winner. I mean, just look at any famous artist from history that you admire. Not every one of them was as equally, equally great. And some of them were actually not that great at all. So I, I think it would be the topic of a, another uh, another session or a workshop of some sort. What I do, well, I do a couple of things. If I'm feeling really discouraged or uninspired, I sometimes just give myself the space to just not do anything for a little while until the spirit will move me, so to speak, and then I'll get inspired. Or I will, like if I'm feeling like I'm having trouble getting going, I will look for some activity, not, not even be a full-blown painting, but some activity that I know that I can succeed at. In other words, I, I kind of design it so that, well, this is something that, you know, I can kind of glide through to help me build my confidence. But I think I was in a group last week and somebody asked, well, geez, does, does anyone ever have a, uh, feel like their painting is, is really hard work and not fun? And it's like everybody like raised their hand. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. It's just always going to be there, I think. I mean, if somebody says, I don't really have any ego is the word I'm using, but I don't have any ego about it, I would be a little suspicious. Like, I think either they're not aware of it or they're not entirely telling the truth. We have an ego. It's just part of our nature. If we didn't, if we didn't care about how our paintings came out, well, we probably wouldn't try very hard. So I think that it's just something you have to monitor. There's a book. Oh, I wish I could remember the title now. She said that little voice over your shoulder that's like criticizing you and giving you a hard time and saying that you suck and you'll never amount to anything. That's just a given. That's that voice is going to be there. And what she said she does, she doesn't like, she, she used the analogy of like, she's driving the car and then there's this backseat driver there telling her about how successful or unsuccessful she is. And what she says is, look, you can sit there and you can say whatever you want, but you are not driving. That's a good way to look at it. It's like not to eliminate it, like stop your thinking or something. It's just what the, it's just what the, the thought process is going to do kind of own it as such you know that's just because you tell yourself oh this painting didn't come out well or i i was a poor painter today doesn't mean 
you are a poor painter just because it it said because your ego said that doesn't make it true yeah i think it's good to know that just not amateur or emerging artists have those thoughts it really yeah. spills over into professional life no matter where you are in your career so i think it's just reassuring for everyone to hear that even you go through this oh yeah i think any artist who is honest with you would go through it in one form or another if it was all unpleasant and you didn't get any joy from it you wouldn't you wouldn't do it you know there, like you said before it, when when a painting when your painting comes out well it's just an enormous source of satisfaction and pride that you that you created it and you're pleased with it absolutely uh, i want to say thank you very much to mitchell here for being a guest on artful minds i really appreciate it i never thought you'd answer my emails so thank you very much Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Yeah, and if you want to check out Mitchell's uh, work, you can go to MitchAlbawa.com. Um, you can start from there. His website has all the resources to every other link that he has as well. And if you want to check out Artful Minds, please go to artfulminds.ca or look at the community at community.artfulminds.ca and go to the Open Studio section. All right, thanks, everybody, for being here. Yes, thanks for attending, everyone, and signing up. Cheers. Bye.